This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Okay, so, so today I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about the work we have been doing in my lab over the last five years or so, trying to uh, understand the underlying cellular and molecular basis of autism spectrum disorders. And before I start, I want to just tell you a little bit about how I came to be interested in autism. Um, so you know, when I, when I uh, got to Stanford, I was interested in a very arcane area of neuroscience. I wanted to understand how ion channels, uh, which are these proteins at the membrane that are really important, how they regulated the development of neurons. I was sort of at the border of, you know, I, I had this idea that I was going to understand how the biophysical properties of this protein change signaling pathways. And I was very happy doing that. Um, and, um, but then, you know, about two years after I started my lab, my son was diagnosed with autism. And so I, uh, you know, I went through all the stages that parents go through when their children are diagnosed with autism. So there was an initial period of denial, followed by a period where I was not going to leave any stone unturned, but it turned out that there weren't that many stones to turn over. I mean, there were a lot, but they just weren't very credible stones. Uh, and then finally to sort of the realization that perhaps, you know, my son was not going to be the road scholar, uh, but that perhaps there was something that we could do to make things better for other people, if not for him. And uh, so, and, and I should just say that, you know, while I'm going to use the professorial we here, I often mean them, that is, uh, you know, the students in my lab, but I also, when I, when I use a professorial we and I mean them, I also mean my wife, who is also a neurobiologist and played a key role in thinking about some of these approaches that we have started to use to try and understand autism. So this is, this is sort of uh, what my lab does. Uh, so there's a, a part of my lab that still works on sort of ion channel biophysics, this is this. There's a little part of my lab that has worked on developing new technologies for studying signaling pathways in cells, taking advantage of light activated proteins from plants. But most of what we do is really over here. We've been trying to understand autism and using as many approaches as possible. And you know, uh, well, but before I go further, and this is probably redundant in this audience, but I still want to give you a little bit of, of background about autism so you understand why we've taken the approach that we've taken. So first of all, you know, you, you probably know that we owe uh, the definition of autism to these two, these two gentlemen, Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, who were uh, Austrian child psychiatrists working in the 1940s. They were interesting in lots of ways, including the fact that they were Austrian child psychiatrists working on, 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 on autism who never cited each other's papers. Uh, and uh, in, 19, uh, in, in, in 1943, uh, Leo Kanner published a, whoops, a paper in a journal called Nervous Child, which they, they don't call journals this anymore, of course. Uh, and uh, and he, he talked about a patient called Donald. And he said of Donald, you know, that he seems self-satisfied. He has no apparent affection when petted. He seems to almost draw into, his shell, into a shell within himself. And this, of course, describes a social impairment that is characteristic of, of autism. You know, he then said, uh, you know, words to him had a literal and flexible meaning. He seemed unable to generalize. And this describes a communication impairment. Uh, he said of Donald that he uh, wandered around making stereotype movements with his fingers. He spun with great pleasure anything he could seize upon to spin. And this, of course, describes a restricted interest in compulsivity. And if you uh, go by the DSM-4, uh, the sort of diagnostic and statistical manual of psychiatry, uh, you, this, in fact, uh, is associated with three different uh, diagnoses. So if you have all three problems, you have autism. If you have social impairment and restricted interest in compulsivity, you have Asperger's syndrome. And if you have a communication impairment and restricted interest in compulsivity, you have the uh, creatively named uh, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. Um, 
And uh, in fact, of course, this is probably going to change with DSM-5. All of these things will be lumped into a single thing. And uh, some of the criteria will change a little bit. Of course, this won't really change the disease. Um, so of course, for, for anybody who actually has an autistic individual in their family, you know that this is, this is just the beginning. Right? These things lie at the center. This is, this is the core impairments. But actually, the things that affect your life are, are, are so much broader. Right? So for example, there are defects in sleep. You know, I could use some more sleep. Uh, you know, there are uh, problems with mood and motivation. There are often uh, anxiety issues. There are issues with attention. There are obsessive compulsive traits. Uh, there are issues with sensory gating. About uh, you know, a third of children with autism have uh, some form of childhood epilepsy. There are uh, about half of the kids with autism have some kind of intellectual disability. Uh, there are, of course, issues of executive function and motivation. Uh, and then, of course, there are medical issues like digestive disorders and cardiac arrhythmias that are also associated with autism. And so this points to the fact that autism, of course, is not a single disorder. It's a whole series of disorders that have some features in common. Um, so what, what do we know about the causes of autism? And you know, for the first 40 years or so after Kanner and Asperger, uh, the idea was basically that this was due to you know, bad mothers. You know, the mothers were cold, they were refrigerator mothers, and they were cold and strange, and therefore the kids were strange. You know, this did nothing for anybody with autism, but it had made lots of moms feel terrible. Uh, but it wasn't really until the 1970s when Louise Ruder and her colleagues uh, uh, first examined the idea that there might be a genetic basis to some kinds of autism. And so what they did was they looked at uh, twins. They either looked at identical twins. These are monozygotic twins that come from the same egg. Or they looked at dizygotic twins. Or they looked at siblings. And they looked at the concordance. So if one child has autism, what are the chances that the other one will also have autism? And so if you look at monozygotic twins, the concordance is somewhere between 60 and 90%. In those studies, it was actually 90%. Now we think it's perhaps a little bit lower. Right? If you look at dizygotic twins, so they have the same mom, they were there at the same, uh, and, and they shared the same, uh, the, the same womb, but they, uh, but they come from, they, have, they don't share all their genes, then the concordance was only about 15%. And if you look at siblings, the concordance again is somewhere between 4 and 5%. Okay? So this tells us two things. Okay? The first thing it tells us is that uh, there is likely a genetic susceptibility. Autism. Now, this doesn't mean that there's a genetic cause, but it does tell you that your chances of getting it are somehow affected by your genes. And that's because monozygotic twins, of course, share all their genes. Okay. It also tells you that it is unlikely to be caused by a single mutation. Because dizygotic twins and siblings share half of their genes. So if it was just one gene, you would expect this to be 50%, and it is not. Okay. So, Okay, so what happened after this? Well, you know, this led to what I often describe as a really rather fruitless search for the genes important in autism for about 25 years. You know, and people uh, essentially looked at whatever their favorite gene was, they sequenced it in a whole bunch of kids with autism, they compared it to people without autism, and they looked to see whether there are any defects. And I would say it was largely fruitless because uh, most of those studies were not reproducible. Uh, and it wasn't really until it became possible to do genetics at a genome-wide scale that some of the mutations that we know of now were started to be identified. Okay, and so you should know the, the first thing. So this is from a figure by Dan Geshwind, and uh, you know I don't know if you can see this, but there are a whole bunch of of blue and red. Uh, regions in these chromosomes. These are all the human chromosomes, and they're these red patches. And these are all the regions that have been associated with autism, either because there are known uh, genes that, are, that have point mutations, or there are copy number variants that cause micro duplications or micro deletions. In some cases, because there are uh, mutations in single bases. Okay? But you can see that there are a lot of them. So the first thing is that there seem to be a lot of loci associated with susceptibility to autism. Now, the second thing is that autism mutations are generally not penetrant. So that is to say, you might have the mutation, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have the disease. Right? And as I'll tell you in a second, this is likely because uh, you need either multiple mutations or there's an element of chance. And I'll, I'll show you a mouse that illuminates that very clearly. Now, the other thing is that autism mutations are almost always associated with other psychiatric and neurological disorders. So this has led to a model that is sort of illustrated here. And this is kind of the, 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 the model for many multi, 
uh, factorial diseases, but it's particularly true for autism. So the idea is that we all have a genetic background. This is what makes us all different. And uh, these, this genetic background are basically a whole bunch of point mutations. And some of those point mutations are protective and some of them confer risk, but then superimposed on that, there are rare mutations that can really tilt the balance. So for example, there are these things called copy number variations, which are micro deletions or micro duplications, or there are rare mutations, which are you know, mutations that occur infrequently in the population, but that can have a really severe uh, effect on development. Um, so the next question is, okay, so we are now starting to understand some of the genetic uh, causes, some of the genetic uh, susceptibility factors for autism, but how do you go from that to trying to understand uh, the underlying mechanism of the disease. And so, you know, so we know something about the genes, we know quite a lot about the behavior. What we don't know is the stuff that lies in the middle, right? How is it that these genes are changing stuff? And so, of course, what happens is the genes ultimately change the structure and function of cells, and those cells, in turn, change the structure and function of circuits, and that ultimately impacts behavior. Okay, so, uh, my lab has really focused at the cell level. And the reason for focusing at the cell level is that this is a level that is much closer to the genetic level. So we sort of, to a first approximation, understand what genes do. And uh, we know we can make uh, guesses as to what mutations uh, might do to the function of a cell. But the other reason for focusing on cell is a much more practical one, which is that I am very interested in trying to develop new treatments. And the way we discover drugs today involves massively screening libraries of compounds, of chemicals, sometimes millions of chemicals. And the thing is, to do a screen, you need something you can screen. If you need a cell or you need a molecule, you can't screen a mouse. You can't screen a complicated circuit. And so uh, from a sort of practical drug development point of view, we need to identify simple targets that we can use to develop the next generation of drugs. And so this is the reason for trying to focus at this level. Okay, so, so how do you normally do this, right? So you know you have a mutation, you think it leads to a behavior, you'd like to understand the stuff in the middle, how do you go from this, how do you uh, address these issues? And so the standard approach, uh, something that we've used for a long time in experimental biology is you, you make a mouse, right? You, you generate a mouse. If you're in China, you actually make it out of snow. Uh, and uh, so you can make a genetically engineered mouse that has a human mutation and then you can look at the behavior of that mouse. And we've made mice, and I'm gonna show you uh, an example of a mouse that we've made that has a mutation on chromosome 16, 16P11.2. It deletes 27 genes, and the reason we've made that mouse is because it is the second most common uh, mutation associated with autism. And um, so, uh, so I'm going to show you this mouse, okay? And so, so these, these two mice are siblings. Uh, one of them has the mutation, uh, so it's missing these 26, 27 genes on one chromosome, which happens to be on chromosome seven in the mouse, okay? And the other one does not, okay? And then I'm going to let you guess which one you think has the deletion, okay? So, here we go. So, so you can see that, that this, this mouse is very, is profoundly hyperactive. Uh, and in fact, you can, you can measure this kind of stuff. You can look at it. This is the number of rotations as a function of time. And you can see that you know, the mice that have this mutation rotate far more than the controls, right? But I want you to notice something else. Okay, so that is interesting. It provides a phenotype in the mouse. But the other thing I want you to notice is down here. Okay, this is exactly the same stuff, except that here you're looking at the number of rotations per an individual mouse, right? And all, you can notice that wild type mice basically don't do this wild spinning. But the, the mice with the mutation do, but not all of them, just a few of them, right? Two or four of them. And the reason that's interesting is because all of these mice have the same genetic background. They're inbred. They're clones of each other, right? And yet, some of them are getting this disease and some of them are not. And this, in fact, is very much like it is in the human population, right? So, um, so people who've been trying to understand why it is that a mutation is not penetrant, it doesn't always give you the disease, well, one of the things that people propose is, well, maybe there are other mutations in the genome that together cooperate to cause the disease, and that's a possibility in some cases, but actually you don't need that. It turns out that at least one of the things that this mutation does is it changes, it, it, it introduces noise somehow in the development of the brain such that 
with some probability, you're going to have a brain that doesn't develop correctly. We don't understand how that works, but I think it's an important sort of conceptual advance, especially when you think about people. Um, Okay, I'm gonna show you another, so of course, rotations are interesting, but a lot of these mice are normal. So we've looked at social behaviors, and I should tell you that for the most part, the social behaviors in these mice are normal, except for this one behavior. Uh, and uh, so I, want to, I have to explain the assay to you. So this is a social memory test that was developed uh, by one of my postdocs. And uh, the, the way it works is as follows. We were, what we wanted to do is we wanted to come up with a way of testing social memory, the capacity of the mouse to remember that it has seen another mouse. And so what we have is we have our sample mouse, and it is going, he's going to be probed with a female. Okay, and when he probed, we probed the female, and then what we're gonna do is we're going to just test to see how excited he is about this, and you'll see in a second how we probe this, but you know, when he sees the female for the first time, he's very excited, okay? Uh, and then we take the female out, and we wait 10 minutes, and we then put our mouse there, and we introduce the same female again, and then we wait to see what happens, and it turns out that he is a little bit less interested, and if you take the mouse, the, the female out, and you try it again, you do this 20 minutes later, he's even less interested. By the time you've waited half an hour, he's not all that interested in this female, as it turns out, okay? Now, if you introduce a new female, right, then he's really interested again, okay? <laughs> So, uh, okay, so, so this is an important assay, right? Because this, this, there is a, a habituation associated with this female, and then there is uh, the, the mouse has to recognize that there's a difference between this first female and the second female, okay? So this is what it actually looks like in, in the mouse world. Um, okay, so, so up here are wild-type mice, and uh, in, I'm going to put in a female, and you'll see what happens. So when you do this, the male is very, very excited about the female, okay? And uh, if you do this with the, the mouse that has the mutation, you know, it looks pretty much the same, okay? They are both very excited, okay? So now we're gonna jump to the fourth presentation, okay? And uh, if you go to the fourth presentation and you now look at the wild type, uh, okay, we're gonna put the mouse, and you see now that they're not quite so excited about each other. They, you know, they're sort of interested, but not quite as excited, okay? Now, interestingly, if you uh, put in the same female, the, the 16P mouse is still super excited about the mouse. Okay, and then of course, if you do the control, if you do the, the new female, right, uh, in the wild type case, you know, again, the wild type mouse is very excited, and the mouse with the mutation is also very excited. So this was exactly the opposite of what we expected, right? You know, these are mice that actually are more interested. They don't lose their enthusiasm for, for somebody they've already seen. Uh, and um, as, as my graduate student put it, you know, they're the perfect husband. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, so, you know, you can, you can quantify this kind of stuff. And uh, this is sort of what it looks like, right? So, you know, if you look at uh, the wild type mice uh, as a function of time, you get, they become less and less interested in the female, right? And if you introduce a new female, they're very excited again. If you take the old female and put it back, they're not interested. If you look at the 16P mice, they just don't seem to lose much, much enthusiasm, right? Okay, so this was paradoxical, and it still is, but, uh, but I have to say it became more interested when we decided to do the control, okay? And so we, uh, sort of belatedly thought, well, we ought to do exactly the same thing with an object, right? Not with a female mouse and see what happens. And so we did this and we found the following remarkable difference. So if you look at an object, wild type mice gradually become less interested in the uh, uninteresting object, uh, but the 16P mice become much more interested in the object. So for some reason, uh, they don't lose enthusiasm about the female, but also they, they just happen to be find this novel object extremely interesting. Um, so we don't know exactly what this means, but uh, you know, this does remind me a little bit of uh, my son and some of his, uh, his classmates, uh, in that you know, it's not so much that they're not interested in people, it's that they're far more interested in you know, the spinning thing in the corner. Right. Um, Okay, so, so we don't really quite understand what's wrong with this mouse, and we're still working on it. But, um, but I, I, you know, and mice for sure are great, they're gonna give us some great insights, but they also have some big problems, okay? So one of the problems is that, uh, despite what I told you about lack of penetrance, there is pretty good evidence that autism does involve the cooperation of many genes. And you know, the thing is that, you know, we can make a mouse with one mutation, we can make a mouse with two mutations, but can we make a mice with 50 mutations? No. I mean, we can't really replicate a human genetic background in a mouse. 
And so this is a problem. We need to be able to study people. Right? Now, the other issue is subtle, but the deal is that mice just are not humans. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and so, so, you know, there, 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 there are lots of, of, of differences. So, so for, for one thing, you know, we are separated by 60 million years of evolution, right? And, you know, I mean, not only has the size of our brain changed dramatically, but also the part, one of the parts that we care about the most, which is the frontal cortex, has enlarged dramatically. You can barely see the frontal cortex in the mouse, but in humans, it's huge. This is a really important part of your brain for regulating social behavior. Um, now, in addition to this, you know, the failure rate in drug development in neurosciences is 95%, right? So, uh, 95% of the drugs that go into phase two or phase three clinical trials fail. Okay. But you know what? Every single one of those drugs work just great in the mouse. You know, as, as my neighbor Ben Barris used to say, you know, if you're gonna get multiple sclerosis, the thing to do is to be a mouse. <laughs> okay? Um, and so, uh, so we need to be able to study people. Right? Um, so, so the question is how, right? And so uh, the problem is that we don't have access to people's brains, right? We, we don't have, you know, in cancer, right? We have access to people's tumors. And this has given us tools that we just don't have in, in neuroscience because you can take a piece of somebody's tumor and you can grow it in a dish and it behaves to a first approximation like it would in a human and you can use that to look for drugs and you can also use that to stage the disease and segregate it and separate it. And really, we couldn't really do that in people uh, until quite recently. But then recently, there was what I think is a revolutionary development in uh, developmental biology. And this is the, uh, the fact that you can now take a somatic cell, like a skin cell, completely specialized to be a skin cell. It is designed to be a skin cell, right? And you can take that cell, and you can introduce into it these proteins that will remodel the DNA and it'll convert that stem cell into, and it'll convert that skin cell into a stem cell. Okay, so this is extremely weird because we used to think that uh, development was like an arrow, right? Or it was, it was like a, you know, it was like spilling water, right? You can, you can spill water, but you can't unspill water. It's a one-dimensional, one-directional process. But it turns out that that's not true. You can take a differentiated cell, you can do stuff to its genome, and you can now convert it into a cell that has the capacity to create every cell in your body. That's a stem cell. Okay, so this was developed by Shinya Yamanaka and his colleagues in Japan. And he originally did it in mouse and then he did it in humans. Now, this is amazing because this gives us the ability to essentially rebuild a piece of somebody's brain, somebody who has a disease, okay? And so the idea behind the project we have been pursuing for about five years is exactly that one. So what we're doing is we're harvesting skin cells from patients, we're reprogramming the skin cells to generate these pluripotent stem cells, we're differentiating them to make neurons of particular classes, and I'll show you how we do this, and then we're phenotyping these neurons. We're trying to figure out what is wrong with them, right? So the first question you might have is, you know, which patients should we start with? And, you know, you might think, you know, the money, there are so many kids with autism, right? The money here would be to take people with autism, this is idiopathic autism. But when we started, uh, that seemed like a really difficult thing to do because autism is not a single disease, it's a whole bunch of different diseases and there was no guarantee that the approach would work. So we wanted people who was, we thought at least had a good chance of having the same disorder. So instead, we took kids that had specific classes of specific mutations, specific syndromic forms of autism. So we have kids, for example, with Timothy syndrome, which is, I'll tell you about, it's a mutation in a calcium channel. We have kids with Phil and McDermott syndrome. They have mutations in a synaptic protein. And I'll talk about these two. But we also have ongoing studies on uh, kids with DeGeorge syndrome, a big collaboration with the Simons Foundation on kids with 16P11.2 deletion syndrome. We have kids with Dravet syndrome. Uh, we have kids with mutations in a protocadherin as well that leads to early onset epilepsy and autism. Okay, so those are the patients. Now, we're going to focus on Timothy syndrome and Phil and McDermott syndrome for the purposes of this talk. Now, the next question is, uh, can you actually reprogram those skin cells to generate pluripotent stem cells? And so when we uh, started doing this, this was magic and very difficult to do, and now it's turned out to be far easier. Uh, and so what we do is we can introduce into these cells these uh, chromatin remodeling factors and transcription factors. And so these are what skin cells look like. They're long and thin, and you can introduce them into the cells along with a fluorescent protein. And then if you put them under the right conditions and you wait a while, these cells that are long and thin start becoming these circular colonies, and you can't see it, but there are tons and tons of little tiny cells here. 
okay? And these are all stem cells. And they look for all the world like a human embryonic stem cell that you would isolate from an embryo, except that these have not been isolated from an embryo. They were isolated from the skin of a child with autism, okay? And now, if you're gonna do this for a lot of people, the way we have, you need to come up with some strategy for making sure that all the cells that you're making are really robust, they're really reliable. And so we have set up a quality control pipeline. And for, so we now have about 60 patients and we've made several hundred lines. And for every line, what we do is we stain with markers for pluripotency. So these are specific proteins that are in pluripotent stem cells. We look at the carrier types, we make sure they haven't lost any chromosomes. Uh, we, for many of them, but we haven't done this for all of them, we introduce them into mice and we show that they can actually form these things called, uh, th that they can actually form different tissues, right? Uh, and so, you know, they can form neural tissue and gut epithelium, this is a kind of tumor, right? And then finally, we look at the uh, expression of their genes. And so we can do these microarrays, this is relatively inexpensive. This is something called a principal component analysis uh, that basically tells you how similar cells are based on the expression of all of their genes and you can see that the cells that we've made, called IPS cells, are uh, overlapping with ES cells, and they're different from fibroblasts and progenitors and neurons. Um, okay, so, so we have a way then of making these cells. We have a way of verifying that they're good. Uh, the next question is, can we convert them into neurons? And so, so here we've really taken advantage of uh, the fact that, you know, we're really building on 30 years of developmental neurobiology in the mouse. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of people, Sally Temple and, and others, have, have developed protocols, Lawrence Tudor, have developed protocols for starting with stem cells and generating neurons in the mouse. And so the question is, could we also do this in humans? And so, uh, so we've developed ways of actually making specific classes of neurons from these iPS cells. And I should say that I am summarizing in one slide what took many years of work, uh, many people to do. But we basically start with these induced pluripotent stem cells, and then we generate these things called embryoid bodies. And these are, uh, these, these, these have, in fact, the three uh, uh, embryonic layers, so ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. We can take these, and if we put them under the right sets of conditions and the right surface, they start forming these little round things, these little tubes. Now this is particularly cool because it turns out that this looks very much like the first step in the development of the brain, which is the, the first step in the development of the brain is the formation of the neural tube, which is a long tube that forms down the back of, of, of an embryo and uh, eventually starts proliferating at one end and it turns over and it forms the brain. So these look very much like the neural tube. And in fact, you can see, for example, that these cells have pro, uh, end cadherin, which is a typical marker for the inside of the tube, the lumen, right? They also have nestin and they have a whole bunch of other markers. Okay, what you can do next is you can take these and isolate them mechanically and you can grow them as these little balls called neurospheres. And uh, these balls are really interesting. They actually have a little hollow lumen and uh, these cells at the very center Right, there are these progenitor cells, and you can tell that they're progenitor cells because if you take one of these things and you slice it down the middle, you can see that there are all these cells that are positive, in this case for a progenitor marker called PAC6. Now at the very center, right, the cells, the early born neurons start being born and they start migrating out. So this, in this case here, this, this is a, a neuron, it's marked with a neural marker. Now we know that these very early born neurons are positive for something called relin, which is important for people who care about this stuff because they're the first neurons to be born. Okay. Now if you wait long enough, about 50 days, you can then take these things and either slice them down the middle or dissociate them to generate these two dimensional cultures. And if you wait even longer, you can even make glial cells, which are the other cells of the brain, right? And so this is what these cultures actually look like, they look for all the world like a culture of neurons that you would make if you dissociated a piece of human brain or mouse or rat brain, okay? Uh, and they form all these very complicated networks. Um, so, you know, one of the first things you might want to know is, are these things actually functional? Are they real neurons or are they some sort of funky, crazy thing you made in the lab? And so the first thing that we did is we looked to see whether they could in fact generate electrical signals because, you know, electrical signals are what the brain, they're the currency of the brain, right? So, so we loaded the, the cells with a calcium indicator dye, uh, and then we have on this side and this side these electrodes that will pass current, and, if, and then we can image this really, really fast using a special microscope. And if you do this, you can see that in fact they're capable of generating uh, you know, electrical events, right? So this is important, this is what you expect of neurons. Now, 
the gold standard for this, of course, is not really this, this approach. It is something called electrophysiology, right? And, uh, you know, it's, and so the basic approach is illustrated here. Essentially what we're doing is we're uh, introducing a, a, you know, a, a, a glass electrode and we're uh, uh, recording the impulses in specific cells. So there is one more innovation that I should tell you about that we have used extensively. And that is that in addition to uh, being able to, so you know, we get these elaborate uh, meshes of neurons uh, of many different kinds. And so in order to uh, try and stratify the different kinds of neurons, we've actually developed a series of reporter genes that are fluorescent and that are characteristic of specific classes of cells. This particular one happens to be characteristic of something, of, of a pyramidal neuron, right? And so in this case, uh, Alex, who is a, a extremely talented and hardworking postdoc, is patching onto the cell, and you can see that it fires beautiful action potentials. This is what a neuron should look like. Now, you can also uh, look at uh, whether these cells are connecting to their neighbors, whether they're forming synapses, and these little electrical events here are classic synaptic events. And in fact, you can even stain for synapses, right? And in fact, if you do this for hundreds of cells, you can see that, you know, at day 50, about a quarter of the cells fire these action potentials. You know, about half of them fire just a single action potential, and then about a quarter of them don't fire any action potentials at all, okay? So, now, the other thing you can do is you can take these cells and put them back into a mouse. And the reason you might want to do that is because while we like our in vitro system, our system in the dish, there are things that happen in the developing brain that we just can't mimic. And so we've done this as well. And so in this case, for example, we've put these cells back into a, a mouse. We've cut a slice of the, of the mouse. And then we're actually measuring the electrical activity of the cells. And so this gives us another way of looking at the electrical properties of these neurons. Okay, so for, uh, for those of you who are developmental neurobiologists, you might wonder what kinds of cells have we made? And this is a really important question because there are many different kinds of neurons in your brain. And uh, we needed to develop a way of doing this, of looking at cell type systematically. And uh, the standard way of doing this is to use antibodies, but the problem is that most of the antibodies that are used to identify classes of cells in the mouse were developed for the mouse, and so they don't work well in humans. Now, the other problem is that we have a system where we're generating lots and lots of cells. We'd like to characterize each one of those cells to see what class of cell we have made. And so uh, to solve this question, we collaborated with an engineer uh, at Stanford, uh, Steve Quake, who has developed this microfluidic platform. And so what we can do is we can take a single neuron, shoot it into a little well, okay, and then from that neuron, we can use uh, real-time PCR uh, to, to look at uh, all of the genes that are expressed in the cell, not all of them, to look at 200 genes in that particular cell. So what that means is that for every cell, so each, one, each line here is a cell, right? And for every cell, if there's a black mark, it means that it's expressing that particular gene, right? And so you can do this not just for whatever, eight cells, you can do this for 1,000 cells or 2,000 cells. And when you do this, you get a distribution of all the different classes of cells that you have in the dish. And this turns out to be really informative, okay? So for example, at day 50, we have about half of the cells are still progenitors, so they're, they're not neurons yet. The other half are neurons, okay? And if you look at them, about half of them are excitatory, half of them are inhibitory. They uh, produce many of the, the important receptors that we care about, like dopamine receptors. Most interestingly, they produce markers for specific layers of the brain, right? And so, you know, it turns out that uh, depending on which layer uh, of the cortex your uh, a neuron lives in, it, it produces a different kind of gene. And so there's a combinatorial code. So for example, we can classify cells as being either lower layer or upper layer. So for example, at day 50, we have many more lower layer than upper layer neurons. And this makes sense because these are the neurons that are formed first and these are the ones that are formed later. We can even make predictions about where they would send their projections based on their gene expression pattern. And so, for example, we can show that there are some of these cells that would form the corpus callosum, that this is the thing that connects one part of your brain to another part of your brain, whereas there are others that expre express different classes of, of genes that would form subcortical projection neurons. So those are the ones that go to your spinal cord from the outer part of your brain, okay? So, so we have then, uh, 
a system that allows us to generate uh, neurons. We have a way of classifying those neurons. We know those neurons are functional. We can look at their electrophysiology. Um, and then the final question is, will we identify any disease-associated phenotypes? And I have to tell you that you know, one of the reasons it was so very difficult to get this funded was because people didn't think we would identify any phenotypes. And, and they had a point. And their point was that you know, by the time you started, you, know, you started out with a, with a child with a disease, and you're going to make a stem cell, and then you're going to take that stem cell and make it into a neuron. So by the time you do all that, who knows, whatever was wrong with the kid might be gone. I mean, you know, because weird things happen when you manipulate them in a lab. And uh, in fact, it was hard. I got lots of interesting reviews. I mean, my favorite one was the guy who, uh, this was you know, in about 2005 or something like that, who, who sent me this, this review that said you know, he thought that identifying a phenotype with this approach was going to be uh, about as likely as catching Osama bin Laden. So I feel way better about that now. Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, so phenotyping neurons. So, so there are basically two approaches that you can take. So one approach is essentially the agnostic approach, the unbiased approach. We can, for example, look at the genes that are expressed in these neurons at different times during development and see whether they tell us something about a specific disease. Now, the advantage of this is we can look at the whole genome. Right. Or we can use, for example, fluorescence-activated cell sorting to look at the uh, uh, activation of specific signaling cascades. So we've done, I'll show you some of this. But the other approach you can take is you can make some educated guesses. And so, for example, we can look at uh, the electrophysiological properties of a disease caused by mutation in an ion channel, for example. And you might expect that these would be altered. Right. So, okay, so now I'm going to focus on a couple of disorders. I'm, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about kids that have Timothy syndrome. So Timothy syndrome is a really rather rare form of uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. It is pervasive, so it is associated with cutaneous syndactyly, so there is this webbing of uh, these two fingers, right? And in addition to this, these kids have uh, these episodic hypoglycemia, so their sugar goes down for no reason at all. Uh, but for us, the interesting thing is that about uh, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of them fit the criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. And then finally, of course, they have this cardiac arrhythmia. And I'm going to tell you about both of these phenotypes. Okay, so it's caused by a point mutation, just a single nucleotide change in the gene that encodes this protein, which is a voltage-gated calcium channel called CAV1.2. And this is a channel that is important because it lets calcium into neurons and into muscle cells when the voltage of a cell changes. And the point mutation is right there at the end of this first set, this is the membrane, right? So this first set of repeats. And uh, what it does is it changes the kinetics of the channel. So normally, this here is current, right, as a function of time. And so here we're simply activating the membrane, we're, we're changing the voltage, and so you can see that the current gets big and then it gets small, right? If you pay, put this point mutation, now the current gets big, but it no longer gets small. So this point mutation inhibits inactivation of the channel. And uh, now there are a couple of more things I should tell you. It's found in only one of the chromosomes, so it's dominant. And it also is found in only one of the two splice forms of the channel, the rare form of the channel. Okay. So in fact, the majority of the, of the cells of the channels in a cell in a child with Timothy syndrome don't actually have the mutation. They're, they have normal channels. Um, nonetheless, it leads to this very severe disorder, and the question is why. So this is a, a, a little a, a girl who uh, is going to be tested on her uh, capacity to recognize different emotions. Okay. She's asked to identify the face that looks very happy. Now before this, she was asked to recognize a smile, and she can recognize a smile. But when she's asked to recognize a face that is very happy, she is flummoxed by this. Um, and, uh, and so this is, this is you know, an example of, of, for her, it is extremely difficult to recognize faces in general, but you know, emotional content in faces. Okay, so, so we took uh, skin cells from her and from other kids with Timothy syndrome. We converted them to stem cells and we made them into neurons. So one of the first things we did is we looked at the electrophysiology of the cells. And we did this because uh, it turns out that this is a mutation in this voltage-gated calcium channel and we thought that it might change the electrical properties of the neuron. And so uh, when we did this, uh, th so the first thing we did is we looked at this and it was a little disappointing. So you can see that this is an action potential and there is a, a very small change in the width of the action potential, but you can see that it's really small. We don't know exactly what this would mean. Uh, but it's only in some of the cells. Right? Now, if instead of doing that, 
you instead look at the calcium inside the cell, right? Uh, and this, in this case, these are cells that are positive for synapsin 1, so they're excitatory, mature excitatory neurons, right? And uh, then you can stimulate the cells with this very large stimulus, right? And when you do this, it, it causes a calcium rise. And the red are uh, kids with Timothy syndrome, and the blue are the controls. And now you can see that there's a difference. Now, we, we rigged this experiment, because it turns out that these channels are the ones that don't inactivate. So, so you can see that there's a big difference. So clearly, at the very least, they have the channel, and they have a mutant channel. This, this may seem trivial to you, but believe me, it was, it was huge, because we were very worried we were not going to see anything. right? Um, and in fact, you can, you can see that not only do they have extra calcium, but it's blocked by nimodipine, which is a classic blocker of this channel. So it seems as if they, in fact, have this channel that uh, carries too much calcium. Um, so now, the next question is, what does this do to the cells functionally? I'm going to show you three phenotypes. So the first one it was entirely based on what is already known about this channel. So it's known that the activity of this channel is really important for determining the shape of a neuron as it develops. Okay? So neurons have this characteristic shape right, with these sort of dendrites out here. And these dendrites are important because this is where a neuron receives all its connections. Right? And uh, so we developed an assay by which we introduced into these cells these uh, ion channels that are activated by light, this channel rhodopsin. And so we can illuminate the cells Every time there's a blue thing, we're illuminating the cells. And every time that happens, the cell goes crazy. It fires a million action potentials. And now we can make this movie. And we can make a movie. And over the course of time, these cells are developing dendrites and forming connections with each other. This is over the course of 12 hours. OK, so we have automated software that can take this and can actually uh, determine uh, every extension and every retraction event. And we can look at differences between kids with Timothy syndrome and kids without. And so what you can see is that in a control, well, as a function of time, there's an increase in the dendritic arbor. But in the Timothy patients, there is a decrease. Okay? And so this was actually kind of interesting, because it means that the activity of this channel is somehow converting what would normally be a stimulus that is causing an increase in uh, the size and the complexity of a neuron, and it's converting it into somehow a sort of a decrease. Um, so. Uh, so, so you might wonder, right, is this some funny artifact in vitro, or is this really also true in vivo? So in parallel, we had made a Timothy mouse uh, where we introduced the, the mutation into the channel. And uh, because we had noticed that there was this defect in the patients, we also looked in the mouse to see if this happened to be conserved. And so uh, these are uh, the basal dendrites of pyramidal neurons. You can see that they're beautiful. They have lots and lots of elaborate processes. Uh, this is in a wild type mouse, and this is in a control. And so you can see that the dendrites have far fewer arbors. And in fact, you can quantify this here. You can see that there's a big difference. Uh, so this is good, because it tells you that, in fact, something that we see in the cells in the dish is recapitulated in cells that developed in the context of a developing brain, albeit that of a mouse. Um, OK, so it turns out that this, this uh, phenotype is so robust, so strong, that we, in fact, used it to try and look for some compounds that might be able to reverse this this defect. And so uh, we screened, in fact, all the compounds that have ever been tried in man. This is something called the low pack library. It's about 1,200 compounds. And, uh, and so what we did is we looked at the dendritic arbors at either uh, you know, two hours or five hours. right? And you can see if you simply look at controls versus TS, there's a big difference. right? Uh, and then these are just some of, the, some of the compounds that we use. So most of the compounds do nothing. This is what you would expect. But then there are a few hits. In fact, these are the only hits we got. Okay. This one is particularly interesting. This is, this is a compound called Roscovitin, uh, which uh, we discovered after we discovered it in the screen, had in fact been identified as a binder to this L-type calcium channel. The interesting thing is that it binds and it rescues voltage-dependent inactivation. Right? So it, it somehow is binding to the channel in such a way that it is making an activation recover. Interestingly, for example, I, I'm not showing it here, but for example, the conventional L-type channel blocker, ni nifedipine, uh, it does nothing. And in fact, it does nothing in the patients either. Uh, we got some other things. This, is, this one, for example, is allopregnanolone, which is a very interesting uh, hormone. Again, we don't know why it rescues. Uh, and this one here is a, is a kinase blocker. Um, so I'm showing you this not because uh, necessarily any of these are going to be something we're about to put in a child tomorrow, but because it proves, it suggests that sort of as a proof of principle, we can use this to identify new compounds. Um, 
Okay, so the other kind of approach you can take is an unbiased approach, where you look, instead of uh, seeing whether there's a defect in calcium or in dendritic arborization, instead you're looking at changes in the expression of all the genes. And this is valuable because at some point, we're going to want to do this for the whole population, not just kids with Timothy syndrome, right? And so uh, uh, under those circumstances, when we do it for hundreds of people, one of the outputs is going to be how the genes uh, are turned on and off in the neurons during development. And we hope to be able to use this as a way of segregating kids into different groups. But before we can do anything like that, we have to show that for a really severe disease, we can actually tell the difference. And so uh, this here, these are neuronal progenitors. These are neurons, okay? Uh, each line here is a particular gene. If it's red, it's high. If it's yellow, it's low, right? Uh, it, there are three patients here. For each one, each patient, there is a separate, uh, there are two lines, okay? But what you can see is that even if you use just unbiased clustering, right, all the Timothy patients fall together and they fall apart from the controls. And in fact, the Timothy patients are far more similar to each other than they are to all the people who don't have Timothy syndrome. Right. So you can also use this as a way of trying to look for specific genes that uh, might be implicated in similar forms of autism that, uh, in, in other forms of autism that are similar to Timothy syndrome. So for example, there are genes that uh, have been implicated in intellectual disability here, uh, like uh, Shank2 and uh, IFTIM3. Uh, these are all genes that have been identified either genetically, in this case, this was actually identified from the brain of, of people with autism. Um, Okay, so you can look at gene expression just at rest, but you can also stimulate the cells and then look at gene expression. And this has also turned out to be really useful. So in this case, we are stimulating the cells electrically and looking for all the genes that are regulated differentially in Timothy patients versus control. So if it's increased in the Timothy patient, it's red. If it's decreased, it's blue. And you can use this as a way of building a kind of signaling cascade. So everything in green here is altered in Timothy patients. Everything in gray is not, but it's a linker. And so this is interesting because it defines a cascade of proteins that are misregulated as a consequence of this mutation. And this is useful because all of these are putative drug targets. Now, we were particularly interested in this part of the pathway. This is tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the rate-limiting enzyme in the production of catecholamines. And this is interesting because catecholamines have long been implicated in psychiatric disease, including autism. So the catecholamines are dopamine and norepinephrine. This dopamine is the stuff that makes you feel you know, happy and motivated. Norepinephrine is the stuff that makes you want to run away from lions, okay? And, um, okay, so, so there are changes in gene expression. The question is, are there also changes in the amount of protein? So in this case, we followed it up by using antibodies that specifically recognize that gene, tyrosine hydroxylase, which is this rate-limiting enzyme. You can see right away that there are far more cells that produce this enzyme in Timothy patients than in controls. Um, in fact, this is not true for just one Timothy patient. It's true for all four of them. Uh, it's also not true in, a, in another uh, kind of disability called 22Q11 deletion syndrome. So, uh, and then finally, you might want to know if these cells are actually functional. Do these kids produce more dopamine and more norepinephrine? And you can see that by, so you can use uh, uh, HPLC to look at this, and you can see that they produce a lot more norepinephrine and a little bit more dopamine. Okay, finally, we can look and see whether Roscovitin, which was the stuff that, we, that reversed the dendritic retraction, does it also reverse the excess production of catecholamines? And we were a little bit surprised here because we thought that what had happened was that there was a change in cell fate. So now we're producing all these cells that are dopaminergic cells. That turns out not to be true. What seems to be happening is that this tyrosine hydroxylase is being produced ectopically in cells that would be other things. The amazing thing is that if you treat them with roscovitin, you can reverse the process. And so this, uh, I think, has, uh, you know, uh, there is some, some hope that at least some uh, of these phenotypes are, are reversible even once they've occurred. Uh, so roscovitin here reverses the production of the green cells, and you can see this there. In addition to the defects in uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, we also looked to see if there were more general defects in differentiation. And, um, it turns out that you can do this by taking advantage of that single cell, uh, uh, the single neuron analysis technique I told you about. Each one of these is a gene. The bars, the red bars are Timothy, the blue bars are controls, and it, it tells you which fraction of the cells produce a particular gene, okay? And so uh, what is interesting, of course, is that, of course, as, as we, I told you, there are more cells that produce tyrosine hydroxylase in Timothy patients, but even more interesting, uh, it turns out that there's another big change, and it's in this population of cells. So 
these two genes, ETV1 and SATB2, define the cells that form the corpus callosum. And uh, in fact, we've known for quite a long time that many kids with autism have a small corpus callosum, right? This is the fiber bundle that connects both sides of the brain. And you can see that they have uh, fewer cells that produce ETV1 and SATB2, uh, suggesting that perhaps they have fewer cells that form these distant connections. Okay, so I just want to stop for one second here. Uh, and uh, just summarize what I've told you before I, I, I present just a few more slides uh, on another disorder. So, so do these cellular phenotypes actually make any sense at all? Um, and the answer is, well, sort of. I mean, you know, it's, it's like everything in science, you can kind of force it to fit your hypothesis. But I think that there are some encouraging signs, at least. Um, so, so the first question is, you know, small dendritic arbors. Well, small dendritic arbors and a small corpus callosum are, are common in autistic patients. I would say that they're not very specific. In fact, it's common in intellectual disability in general. But nonetheless, it's uh, consistent with a, a defect in intellectual function. Um, how about excess production of catecholamines? Well, we have known for quite a long time that dopamine D2 antagonists can be effective for some kinds of behaviors in kids with autism, specifically repetitive movements. The dopamine, the D2 antagonists are horrible drugs and they should not be given unless you really, really need them. Nonetheless, uh, they do suggest that there might be a defect in, in dopamine. Um, how about uh, the fact that there's more norepinephrine, right? So these kids are really anxious, really, really anxious. So anxious, in fact, we have to sedate them to put them on planes to bring them to Stanford, right? So it turns out that uh, they, uh, beta adrenergic agonists are in fact risk factors for autism. So uh, this is generally consistent with uh, generally consistent with the idea that this defect may cause some of the phenotypes of the patients. Um, and finally, beta blockers uh, have been reported. So blockers of, of norepinephrine receptors have been reported to increase language fluency. So they increase. Uh, the capacity of children to acquire language. And in fact, we have started using beta blockers in kids with Timothy syndrome. Uh, and it turns out that this has allowed them, some of them, to you know, dramatically increase their uh, acquisition of language, which is, which is actually kind of amazing. Though I, I suspect that at least part of this is because they're just a lot less anxious and it is easier to learn when you're less anxious. But uh, nonetheless, it is consistent with what we found in addition. We would never have tried it were it not for the fact that you know, it's clear that they make too much of this. Um, OK, so I want to just spend a, a minute or two telling you about the other phenotype in the Timothy patient, which is a, uh, a phenotype associated with their cardiac arrhythmia. These kids have long QT syndrome, which is generally thought to be a defect in the, uh, in the length of the contraction of the ventricular cardiomyocytes. And so uh, what we, to our surprise, I should say the mice have no cardiac phenotype. And so, uh, probably because the mouse heartbeat is about 500 beats per minute and your heartbeat is 60 beats per minute. And so we decided to make uh, cardiomyocytes from Timothy patients. So if you make them from just wild type, from normal people, uh, uh, I should say neurotypical individuals, uh, you know, and you look at, their, at the beating of these cardiomyocytes, uh, well, one thing is that they're, they're perfectly uh, designed to beat at 60 beats per minute and you can see them beating beautifully, right? Okay, now if you do this from TS patients, you can see a problem right away. So they beat, but they beat really slowly, and they miss beats, right? And they beat really slowly. And so, um, in fact, you can quantify this kind of stuff, right? And so you can see, for example, that in the Timothy patients, they often miss beats, sometimes they beat twice. And uh, in fact, you can actually measure the electrical events using patch clamping. And you can see a couple of things. You can see, first of all, that the calcium current is far bigger in the Timothy patients. This is what you might expect. But if you look at the action potential, the action potential is also much longer. Right? Now, in addition to this, you see these little events here, which we believe to be uh, something called the delayed after depolarization, which we think helps to explain why it is that See, the long QT in itself is not uh, what is terrible. What is really lethal is the fact that this predisposes somebody to getting a ventricular arrhythmia uh, and uh, a, a ventricular fibrillations. And so it's thought that these delayed after depolarizations might be important in this process. 
Um, finally, we can actually use Roscovitin again to try and reverse the phenotype. And again, Roscovitin works beautifully, probably because it's reversing the defect and inactivation in the channel. So you can take these long action potentials and make them shorter, uh, and you can eliminate some of these delayed after depolarizations. Um, okay, so for the last two or three minutes, I'm going to tell you about uh, kids with Phil and McDermott syndrome. So uh, these kids have uh, a, a, another kind of autism. They have neonatal hypotonia, they have global developmental delay, and they have absence or severely delayed speech. And they have a mutation on chromosome 22. 22Q13. And it turns out that this encompasses multiple genes, but one of the genes in this region is a gene that encodes for a synaptic protein called Shank. In this case, it's Shank3. And so this is a synapse, and Shank3 seems to be this scaffolding protein uh, that is important. And the question is, why is it that loss of one copy of Shank3 would lead to the severe disease? And so. Uh, so one of the first things we did after we made the neurons is we first looked to see whether in fact it was the case that if you lost one copy of Shank3, you actually had less Shank3 protein. Because it turns out that that's not true for many genes. You know, we're actually, all of you out there are, uh, have, have just one copy of about 120 genes and you're perfectly normal. That's probably because just one copy is enough to make all the protein that you need. But in this particular case, if you lose one uh, copy of, of the Shank3 gene, then you have half the amount of message and you also have half the amount of protein, right? which is sort of illustrated here. Um, so we patch clamped the cells and now this is a synaptic protein and so we focused on the function of the synapse. Okay, so these here are synaptic events, right? This is what a control looks like. There are all these synaptic events. And in this, these kids with 22Q13, Phil and McDermott syndrome, you can see that they are far smaller, right? And so the question is why? So these are spontaneously occurring. Now the question is what happens if you actually evoke the release? So, so in this case, we're going to stimulate uh, some of the presynaptic cells and look at the postsynaptic cell to see if in fact there is a defect in this capacity of the neurons to send impulses to each other. And so, okay, so what we're doing here is we're stimulating right here and we're measuring in the postsynaptic cell Right? In this case, it's a pyramidal cell because it's marked green, right? and, and you get this very nice big response. Right? Uh, but if you do this in a patient that is missing Shank3, you can see that the response is far smaller. Right? In fact, uh, you can do this. This is really for the cognoscenti in the audience. You can look at both AMPA receptors and you can look at NMDA receptors, and there seems to be a defect in both. Right. And uh, this simply quantifies this. Basically, you should look at the red line and the green line. The fact that the slopes are different tells you that synaptic responses are far worse in the green cells than they are in the red. Right, so. Um, why is this? Well, uh, we've looked really carefully at uh, these, those actual, those proteins, the AMPA proteins, the NMDA proteins, and it turns out that, in fact, there are fewer receptors. So there are fewer AMPA receptors, right? There are also fewer NMDA receptors. They have far smaller currents. It also seems that the NMDA receptors are different because they have a different voltage relation, uh, voltage current relation. But if you look at the inhibitory synapses, so not the excitatory ones, but the inhibitory synapses, they're completely normal. So inhibitory synapses are normal. So this is interesting because for a long time, people have suggested that there are these, uh, this might be an imbalance in excitation and inhibition. And in this case, we actually have cellular evidence that there is a defect in excitation and inhibition. Now, I have to tell you, I think the hypothesis is a little bit stupid because the fact is that every psychiatric disease is associated with a defect in excitation and inhibition. But in this particular case, it's clear that the inhibitory synapses are just fine. It's the excitatory synapses that are wrong. Um, okay, so is this because their dendrites are wrong? Well, it turns out that actually the Phil and McDermott mutation makes the dendrites bigger. So they, they have more arbors. This is different from Timothy syndrome, right? And you can actually quantify this here, uh, but it's quite obvious from the image, right? Um, now, the final thing we did, and I'm really running out of time, is we looked for things that might reverse this. And in this case, we didn't do a screen. We just tested uh, compounds that people had suggested might improve the formation of synapses. And so uh, what you want to look at is the ratio between the red and the green. They're, these are neurons that are plated in the same dish, and we're looking at the number of synapses, and uh, each one of these dots is a single neuron. Right? And uh, we're treating the cells with a bunch of different things that people have suggested might be important. It turns out that most of them, if you look at the ratio, 
you know, the ratio is still very big, right? This is control, and this is uh, the patients, and the patients are still not quite as good as the controls, except perhaps in IGF-1. And so because IGF-1 seemed to work in this assay, we also looked at its ability to rescue synaptic transmission electrophysiologically. And to our surprise, even though it only rescues some of the the, some of the staining, it dramatically rescues the ability of uh, the presynaptic cell to send signals to the postsynaptic cell. You can see this here. Remember that this used to be down here. Now you get this gigantic response, right? Okay, so, uh, and, and of course, you can now see that the green line is over the red line instead of being down here. Uh, okay, so, uh, I, so where is this going? What are we gonna do next? And so, uh, so one of the things that I want to do, so it, it's, I think that uh, we're sort of at the point where we're establishing a proof of principle that uh, allows us to, that, that shows that we can actually use this approach to uh, uh, characterize cells from kids with autism and in some cases we can uh, discover phenotypes and, uh, I, I, but we want to do this for many, many more people. And so to do this, we're forming this collaboration with the Allen Brain Institute, which is supported by Paul Allen in Seattle. And what we want to do is we want to do this on a much larger scale for many more kids with many more disorders and some kids where we don't even know what the mutation is. Because we think that this will provide insights that will allow us to both differentiate kids as well as uh, provide some uh, possible treatments. Um, so let me just uh, finish by just telling you where I think things are. Um, I think in some ways things are great, right? You know, I mean, we've made progress. I mean, the field has made progress, right? And we, and we have as well. I mean, so we can make mouse models of human autism. I mean, I showed you one mouse, but there are now a bunch of mouse models of autism. And that's great. This is way better than it was five years ago, okay? Uh, we can make neurons from kids with autism, and that's really revolutionary, right? We can identify some defects in these neurons, and that's important. And we can even sometimes identify compounds that reverse these defects, and some of these compounds might even be good lead compounds that might eventually become drugs, right? So that's good, um, but in some ways the glass is, is, it might be the wrong half of the glass. Um, and so what are the problems? Well, you know, one problem, as I showed you, is that mouse or mice are just not really great models of humans, right? Our, our mouse, you know, is interesting, but in fact, it's sort of slightly hypersocial, right? Um, you know, human neurons, uh, I've shown you all these human neurons, but the fact is that we are still in the early days of figuring out what those neurons really are. I mean, we know many of them are not mature. Their properties might not be the same as the properties in vivo. And then the final thing, which is I think the key issue here, is that, uh, you know, we've identified cellular phenotypes, but uh, showing that that cellular phenotype actually causes a disease, that is really hard, right? And uh, I mean, unless, and really, ultimately, we will only be able to tell if we have a drug that reverses the cellular phenotype that also does something to somebody's cognitive performance. And that's a high bar. So, you know, we're still, we still have to figure out how to actually address this issue. So. I'm sorry I went long, but thank you very much for your attention. And, uh... So Ricardo, that was wonderful. Two questions come to mind. So Timothy syndrome is a propensity to drive the CAV 1.2 into mode 2 gating. It doesn't inactivate properly. There are several other mutations that are disease causing but they don't cause autism in CAV 1.2. So why CAV 1.2 at 406? Yeah, so, so, so why is it that, that you get, uh, you know, if you have that mutation, you get uh, autism, but if you have mutations in other places, you don't, for example, you get Brugada syndrome, right, if you have a mutation in another part of the channel. Uh, I think we partly understand that. So part of it is that it's in exon 8A, which happens to be expressed in early in development. So it's expressed in the precursor cells and in the neuronal progenitors, and then it largely goes away to be replaced by eight. And uh, so we think that that uh, is one of the reasons why it uh, causes autism and other mutations don't. Um, of course, mutations in the L-type channel are also associated with bipolar disorder. And so perhaps there is something there, but most of those mutations seem to be loss of function mutations in one chromosome. So. So, uh, yeah, so the, I mean, I guess the short answer is I don't really know, but I think it has, has to do with the, the expression pattern of that specific exon. Okay. 
So in, in the 22Q model, you, you show that uh, glutamatergic signaling is, is essentially down quite a bit, right? Yeah. And GABA is the same. So why are you getting increased dendritic growth? You'd think you'd go and, yeah. Yeah, it, it, entirely paradoxical. I, we think that it's, it's a, uh, it's a homeostatic mechanism. I mean, in general, neurons want to get a certain amount of electrical activity, electrical input. There is sort of synaptic scaling that is necessary. And I think that because they're getting very little electrical input, they're growing larger to see if they can get more input. But that's just a hypothesis. Beautiful talk. And about the Timothy syndrome, I guess following up on Isaac's question, is, is it the dysfunction in calcium locally in, 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 that's influencing dendrite growth and so forth? Or as we were talking earlier about, is it, is it something about signaling uh, ah. with respect to the channel? Yeah, yeah. so we, we've yet. studied that extensively. Um, so I didn't show you that data because it is really sort of hardcore biochemistry. There is something very strange about the Timothy mutation. Uh, it turns out that we, when we, we, we know, w once we discovered that it caused retraction, we started looking for the mechanisms, and we did this in a bunch of ways. We made a fly that has a Timothy channel, and uh, initially we thought the most obvious hypothesis was, you know, too much calcium bad, no calcium bad, just in the middle is good. It's kind of the Goldilocks hypothesis, right? Uh, and that turns out to be wrong. Uh, if you, for example, take a wild type channel and increase the amount of calcium going into that channel, you don't get retraction. If you take a Timothy channel and you reduce the amount of calcium outside of the neuron and you depolarize that neuron, you still don't get retraction. If you make a Timothy channel that has point mutations, so you can substitute these glutamates so it no longer carries calcium, it doesn't carry calcium any longer, it still gates, it still causes retraction once you activate it. So we think that, in fact, there is a conformational change in the channel that is causing retraction to happen, um, which is very counterintuitive. Um, we don't exactly know how it works, but it's, it's doing, based on genetic epistasis, it somehow activates rho signaling. Uh, that's basically what we know. I read occasionally that there are critiques about the whole process and sort of um, bringing them back to stem cells and back up, that you, you've genetically altered them so that the final resultant product is, is not really like the phenotype you'd have in the human brain. It, I just would like to know, where does that controversy stand and sort of what's your take on it? Yeah, okay, so I think that, um, so there are two classes of, of, I think, arguments that people have made. So one argument is that, uh, you know, the, the process of, during the process of uh, de-differentiation and re-differentiation, you might accumulate new mutations. So we've known for a long time that if you keep cells in culture for a long time, they start accumulating mutations. And so uh, we and other people have now measured this. Um, so on average, these cells acquire about one uh, copy number, one new copy number variation every 20 generations. Okay, so it is for sure an issue if you have very old cells, but it is probably less of an issue uh, if it's early on, right? Uh, and many of these, of course, are benign. Um, so I think that's not as much of a problem. Um, there is another concern, which is that when you de-differentiate the cells, you are essentially changing the, re the organization of the chromatin, right? And that when you do that, you may not do it completely. And furthermore, that depending on which cell you start with, whether it's a skin cell or a blood cell, you may end up with a different kind of stem cell. And, and I think there, uh, the, first of all, the argument that you're changing the chromatin is I think mostly true in just one locus. Uh, where we don't exactly know what that locus does, but it does seem that the reprogrammed cells are somewhat different from ES cells that you get from an embryo at that one locus. And so uh, there we don't know what that means, and we don't know if that would actually change the phenotype beyond the fact that we and other people have now made iPS cells for mice and compared them to the neurons, and you, know, you get some of the same phenotypes. Um, the, there is th there, then there is the, the question about uh, whether there are differences uh, depending on which cell you come from. And, and, and I, I would say that while there may be differences, um, I take kind of an operational uh, view of this, which is that ultimately what we need to do is we need to see whether there are predictable uh, phenotypes associated with specific diseases that we can then verify in vivo. 
So for example, in the case of Timothy patients, we can actually go and measure L-DOPA, which is the product of tyrosine hydroxylase in the blood, and we can show that it's elevated. Right? So that seems to be a good phenotype. But it's entirely possible that there are going to be artifacts, either with the process or uh, somewhere else having to do with culture conditions that will produce phenotypes that are not reproducible. But in that case, they should not be disease-related. Right? So that's, I guess, my, my general view of this. This is a great talk, Ricardo. This uh, basically is a follow-up to what uh, David was asking, and that is, for the middle point of your last slide for the glass half empty, is there any post-mortem or brain biopsy essentially data that looks in human in vivo at the cellular phenotype of the differentiated cells in Timothy syndrome and what you've produced? Yeah, so uh, I mean, as you heard from the very beginning of this talk, uh, the issue of brains is, is a, is a is difficult data? and delicate one, and we don't have any Timothy brains. Um, we have some 22Q11 brains that we might be able to use and compare. Um, so we're working on that. We're actually trying to do an interesting experiment. We've collaborated with a neurosurgeon, and so we're actually looking at, uh, this is somebody who has a mutation associated with epilepsy, so it's not exactly relevant, but we're looking at cells removed in epilepsy surgery and comparing them with cells that we made in the lab. It's not perfect, but it's sort of an approach, I guess. So you mentioned the Timothy syndrome mouse several times, but I didn't actually see. Is it alive? Is it dead? Is yeah. it otherwise? We have a lot of Timothy syndrome mice, as it turns out. Uh, we, we have, we have there, is, there is one Timothy syndrome mouse, right, that was published. Uh, and it, it, it is a very strange one, which has the mutation in the wrong exon. Uh, so we've looked at that. That one is alive and pretty normal, actually, except for these very subtle social behaviors. Um, we have a real Timothy mouse, and that one is alive, uh, and it doesn't seem to have a cardiac problem either. Uh, and uh, we're still, and some of the data you saw was actually from that mouse. Uh, we're still trying to analyze it. Um, it has problems that are very subtle, I guess I would say. I, I, I try to paint it as optimistically as possible, especially when I'm talking with my postdoc. You know, um, and then we have, but strangely enough, but then we have this inducible Timothy mouse where we can express the Timothy channel in different parts of the brain. And you can do all manner of really wacky things by putting Timoth the Timothy channel in like the cortex and uh, in the striatum. And we put it, for example, we cross it to a, to a mouse line where it's, it, it, you make the Timothy channel only in the dopaminergic and the D1 cells. And it, it's, that's a wacky mouse. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so you can do sort of interesting things like that. We, so, I mean, I think the, the short answer is we, it's alive. The real Timothy mouse doesn't have many phenotypes, and we're trying to figure out, you know, if it has any, what it has. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.